us today, a little draft audio. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Stuart, who's joining us from Quested Monitoring, who's going to be talking us through uh, well, speakers and design and different features and stuff he's going to pretty much make for us. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's awesome. So, yeah, if you'd like to just uh, put your hands together for Stuart. So, as next says, I'm going to wing it. Uh, so, my name is Stuart. I'm from uh, Quested Studio Monitors. I'm one of the directors there. I uh, joined the company about two years ago. Uh, and today, we're just going to go over a little bit of history of studio monitoring. Um, a little bit where sort of Quested fits into that story. Do many of you guys know Quested or know the history of Quested? Anyone? Anyone? A few, all right. Well, we'll cover a little bit of the history of where we come from uh, in that process. And then we'll have a little listen to some of the uh, monitors uh, in the studio here off the side. And then we'll finish up with listening to uh, a new system, or reworking of a system that's actually been around for a few years. Uh, but we've now made it as a freestanding system. Um, most of our big systems are designed as soffit now uh, for large format studios and control rooms. Um, but we've now done a, a version of one of those soffit systems uh, as a free, freestanding system. So. Let's get started. So, early uh, recordings didn't rely on studio monitors uh, when they were making those recordings. Uh, often, technicians would set up uh, one, two, maybe three microphones, and they would dart between where their control room was, uh, and listen to the orchestra that was playing, generally, um, and they would meet up what was coming in via the VU meters on their, uh, on their equipment, and then they would only listen to the playback afterwards uh, on the pretty basic speakers of the time, just to check they were getting the balance right, and they would move the musicians around uh, to be in the right position for the microphones to pick up and get a balance. Uh, and then they would just check that reference listening back. And then, uh, in kind of like the 1940s, uh, tape came into, into the world, and that changed everything in terms of, uh, of recording studios, uh, and certainly studio monitoring. So, studio monitors then started to appear when tape came along, uh, because of what tape brought to the, the party was people could now start uh, doing things far more creatively, uh, because they could play back, record and play back at the same time, and start doing things like multi-track. So the first studio monitors started to appear in the 1940s, and in the US it was a company called Altec Lansing, um, who were designing components, uh, which is now JBL, uh, Altec Lansing. JBL. And in the UK, Tannoy uh, was pioneering uh, the technology of the drivers. And studios would buy these components and then build studio monitors bespoke to their studio space that they had and change the cabinet loading. And so that's when, when monitoring started to kind of come into effect. And, and the real thing that, as I say, drove that is the fact that engineers and technicians were now relying on the monitoring a lot more than they were in the earlier recordings because now we were doing things like multi track. Uh, and being a lot more creative in the recording process. So into the kind of 1960s, the creativity just kept on expanding. Uh, in the UK, there was a guy called Joe Meek. Uh, he was a pretty crazy guy. Uh, ended up killing his landlady, I think. Uh, so he was, he was a bit of a bit of a madman. But he was really pushing the boundaries of what could be done in studios at the time. And he kind of was one of the guys who was doing lots of stuff with multi-tracking and effects. And he was, they think, one of the first guys to ever do a DI, a direct inject, into a console with crocodile clips across the back of a guitar cap speaker and then built a kind of rudimentary circuit and brought that direct into the desk and was no longer relying on the microphone to pick up the guitar sound. Um, and that was Joe Meek. And in the US, guys like Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys were really, again, pushing the boundaries of production. Does anyone here know, there's an album called Smiling Smile by the Beach Boys. Does anyone know what the reverb sound is on that? That album, no? It was uh, Brian Wilson's emptied out swimming pool, and he would have the vocalist lay down in the pool with a microphone at the opposite end, and would have them sing with their faces down, and, and that's the reverb sound. And in the kind of 60s, lots of studios got their work because of the reverb rooms that they had. They had a specific room purely for reverb. To me, it's always been a one U rack mount unit or a plug-in, you know, uh, but these guys were having to come up with all these different ways to kind of fatten out sounds and come up with these ideas. So, 
during that time with Joe Meek uh, in the 60s, uh, he had a lot of session musicians who used to work with him. Uh, and one of those guys was a guy called Jimmy Page. And um, Jimmy Page did a lot of work with Joe Meek, session work. And he then went on to form a band. He was in a few bands, uh, but one of his bands went into a, a studio called Olympic Studio in London. And um, that band was Led Zeppelin. And they went in and recorded Led Zeppelin's debut album. And this is where Quested starts to join the story of recording studios and studio monitoring. Um, the engineer and really producer on that album, Jimmy Page, uh, was a guy called uh, Glyn Jones. And he had taken a guy on under his wing a little bit, a guy called Roger Quested, and that's kind of where we, we started our foundations. And Glyn was working with lots of artists like the Rolling Stones, um, Johnny Halliday, uh, tons and tons of artists, The Who, and, and Roger was kind of his apprentice uh, during that period. Um, and Roger kind of learned an awful lot through working with, with Glyn. And Glenn, uh, Roger progressed on to be a studio engineer in his own right, and he went on to work with artists like Pink Floyd, this picture here. There's Roger Quested with Roger Walters, and they were recording, I think, Obscured by Clouds in, in that shot. Um, recorded guys like the, the Kinks, John Denver, uh, Paul Simon. Uh, and so Roger was an engineer at heart. He had always been messing around with speakers and things, and that's how he kind of got into audio in the first place. But he's, a, you know, he's an engineer, prospective designer. So as Roger progressed through his career, he then went on and jo joined a studio called uh, Dick Jones Music, uh, which was a, a sort of publishing house studio in London. Uh, and Dick Jones, uh, DJ, DJM was set up by Dick Jones and uh, Brian Epstein, the, the manager of the Beatles. Uh, and it was whilst Roger was working at this studio, they decided that they needed to look at the studio monitoring system. And this is kind of the late 70s, early 80s now. Uh, and so Roger, having had this passion for speakers, decided he would look to design the speakers for that particular studio. And so what Roger actually wanted to do, the traditional thing for large format monitors in those studios was 2x15s with a compression driver. They were a bit more like a PA speaker in truth at the time. Uh, and every studio sounded a little bit different. Um, and so when you went in and worked on those systems, you would have to kind of be aware of what that system was doing in the room and adjust your mix slightly to get the balance kind of right because they weren't super accurate at the time. Uh, Roger wanted to design a really accurate studio monitoring system, but large format. And so he kind of went against the trend and he wanted to design a three-way speaker system. Uh, and he did a lot of research and he came across uh, a company called ATC, which we all know pretty well now. At the time, we're just designing drivers. And so he, he worked with ATC uh, and basically used a mid-range driver, which I think at the time was being used in one of their hi-fi systems. Uh, and looked at basically trying to, talking with those guys, could they make it more powerful, make it integrate into the studio monitor a bit better. And that is what went into the system. And so that was the first time a soft dome mid-range driver, a uh, soft dome high frequency was used in that configuration within, within Studio World. And so the system went in uh, with, with Roger's design and um, engineers sort of started coming through the studio who were working there and couldn't believe the accuracy of the system and that they could work on it for quite long periods of time uh, as a studio monitoring system and not kind of get tired or fatigued even when they're working sometimes at, at relatively high levels. And so Roger started to receive requests from some of these engineers uh, to see if he would look at doing monitors for other studios that they worked in regularly. And um, so Roger decided there was a bit of a conflict with working at DJM, so he decided, decided to leave DJM and he set up Quested Monitoring Systems in 1985. And some of the early, early adopters of those systems around London, the news spread pretty fast. Um, this slide didn't really more for me because I just love Pearl Jam 10, it's one of my favourite albums of all time. And I only found out recently it was actually mixed at a, a studio called Ridge Farm. Uh, and Ridge Farm had one of the early uh, Q215 systems uh, in there, uh, along with Ozzy Osbourne albums recorded there, Thunder, Sade, lots and lots of huge albums at the time. 
Another studio that picked up Cuesta pretty quickly was Abbey Road. And over the last 33 consecutive years, uh, Abbey Road has had a <coughs> Cuesta system in one of the studios. Uh, started out, I think it was Studio One, uh, then Studio Two, and uh, Studio Three. Uh, and the most recent uh, addition that they did was in Studio Three, which was in 2012, when they installed a, a 412 system uh, into Studio Three. Uh, and so over that whole period of time, they've always had a, a Cuesta monitoring system uh, within one of, the, one of the studios. Other early adopters at the time were guys like Trevor Horn uh, and Sam, the Sam uh, record for, or studio uh, and record label. Um, uh, and Trevor Horn, during the kind of 80s, 90s, and he's incredibly busy now, um, phenomenally talented uh, producer. Um, works with lots and lots of artists, and he, Sam has multiple systems in the various studios that they have, uh, but they've got a quest of system in, in Sam in London, they had one in Sam LA, which unfortunately was caught up in the fires during December, uh, I think the guys are looking at rebuilding that facility now. Uh, and then Trevor's personal studio, which is at his home, is, is a Quest Ed uh, 112 system. Um, and so Quest, Trevor's been using our system now for uh, pretty much 30 years, uh, Trevor's been mixing on our stuff. Um, and as he, he said to me, I was talking a little while ago, and he says, you know, they, he's always trying out new stuff, but he always comes back to, to working on, on his Questhead system. It's, it's where he feels sort of most comfortable uh, when, he's, when he's working. Another early adopter of our systems um, was a studio which was called Lil Yard. And at the time, Lil Yard uh, was the studio of Hans Zimmer. And uh, he was doing... Um, commercials, he was in a number of bands doing synth programming, really early synth programming with the Buggles and working with guys like Trevor Horn. Uh, and when uh, Hans Zimmer did that first studio, uh, he got a Quested system in there. Uh, and there's Roger uh, with, with Hans. And to this day, uh, Hans Zimmer is still using Quested monitors uh, when he moved over to LA. Um, Roger actually helped him design his, his writing room. Uh, and in there, they've got 415s uh, in the soffit system in the back wall, and uh, the 2108s as his near fields. Uh, and Hans pretty much does most of his work on, on 2108s uh, when he's working and doing score, uh, score writing. And because of our association with Hans and the way his facility has been developed at Remote Control, it really is this kind of creative hub in encouraging new talent for, for the film scoring community. Um, and because of that, we, we've picked up a fair few uh, guys who are doing film score work. Another chap here, Harry Gregson Williams, a uh, very talented uh, writer again uh, from the UK who moved over to LA and worked with Hans, um, who's worked on a number of films in his, in his own right over the last sort of 20 years, really. Um, and we have quite a few more. These are just some of the sort of film scores which we know Quest has been involved in, or that all these guys have the credits to. Uh, there's some huge films there, you know, from the ones with Hans Zimmer, we think like Gladiator and The Lion King, uh, and the Batman type films, Harry Gregson Williams with things like uh, The Martian, um, uh, parts of Prometheus soundtrack, uh, Wolverine. Um, and we have a couple of other guys there as well, the guys who did the uh, Steve Chabosky, who did the Transformers soundtrack, uh, the guy who did the all Despicable Me film scoring. Um, again, all of these guys use 2108s, which we'll listen to a bit later in the, uh, in the other room. So, Rob Alton. Um, not picture of the club of Rob, but Rob Alton is, uh, again, another big producer, uh, a mix engineer based in the UK. Um, he came out of Hans Zimmer's studio, uh, and when he kind of built his own studio, he again stayed with Quest and has been using Quest for about 10 years. This guy, Servan, uh, he again is a, a fantastic mix engineer producer uh, with his 32 uh works on some absolutely huge albums. Um, and we have a few uh, people in the US using Quest systems, mainly because they've heard them through Servan. The thing with Quest is we, we don't tend to advertise. We have, it's not something that we've really been into. Our whole structure is built on recommendation and word of mouth. And then when you come into something a little bit more uh, kind of current right now with things like um, dance production, 
uh, a guy called Mike Vale, who's been using Questa uh, for the last sort of, I guess, five, ten years now. Um, he actually, I think he said he sold his first car uh, so he could buy his monitoring system because uh, he heard a system that a, a French studio was blown away with it uh, and decided that uh, you know he really needed to have a monitoring system like that and so sold his car to buy the system uh, that he was looking at at the time. And so Questec, we're a very small company. We, we have built all of our stuff, we're based down in Devon, um, in a place called Honiton, just outside of Exeter. Small team of guys, um, and we've built everything there on site, uh, loaded all up, uh, and everything ships uh, around the world from there. And we ship to about 30, 32, 33 countries right now we ship to uh, around the world. And so when monitoring, when we're looking at monitoring, there's obviously different uh, terms that people use, such as near-field, mid-field, large format. What's the point of a near-field monitor? Any of you guys know why, why you'd have a near-field monitor? So a near-field monitor is designed to be, as it says, near-field, about half a metre, maybe a metre away from you. Uh, and a near-field monitor really is there so that it doesn't, you're not hearing the room, basically. The, the further away from the speaker what you are, the more the room is playing a part in what you're hearing. When we listen to these guys a bit later, you know, we're listening in an untreated room, so we're not in a perfect environment here to listen to this stuff. You know, when you hear a studio monitoring system in a, in a proper studio room that's treated, it's, it's a whole different level uh, when you listen to them. But a near-field monitor really is designed to be used as, as it says, near-field, half a metre, up to about one and a half metres away. Midfields get a little bit more tricky because you are then starting to play to the room a bit, and then when you go to large format, you really kind of want to be mindful of the space. You know, the room is playing a huge, huge part in, in what you hear uh, and how the system will perform. And so anytime you're looking at a large format system, you really want to be looking at the, the acoustics in your room and making sure the room's treated, uh, and ideally really designing the room around the speakers and what you want to do. Position of speakers is really important. Uh, a lot of people, uh, when they're using near fields, mid fields, they often aim the speakers in the wrong position. Um, it does depend on the speaker design a little bit. Um, but with Quested, what you want is the acoustic center of the speaker, uh, which on these guys sort of sits somewhere around here. You want that crossing about a meter behind your head, and that's where you'll get the best <coughs> stereo image. If you have the speakers pointed directly at you, you, you don't get such a wide stereo field. Um, and these, these do deliver a very wide field uh, of stereo sound uh, and depth when, when, you know, when you're listening to them. So that's our entire range. Obviously, you can see we've got big ones here, but we do do much smaller monitors as well. Um, you know, uh, in the S series, S6, which is the five inch speaker, which we don't have here. We will listen to, for the first time, um, to a little one called the V2104, which is next door. Uh, which is a little four-inch speaker, uh, very, very compact. Uh, and then we do things up to sort of self-powered three-way speakers. Uh, and then we still produce a passive range of speakers as well. There are some uh, people out there, producers, engineers, who like to partner speakers with a particular amplifier um, to, to get to the reference that they want to work with. So this is the 2104, which we're going to listen to in a minute, um, with just some of the, the basic specifications there. It's a, it's a preliminary sort of specification on this speaker. Uh, it really is a near-field monitor. Um, an important thing to add, we don't use corrective EQ in any of our systems. It's when we design our systems, we design them from the, the acoustic point of view. Um, and we don't really want to be using any corrective EQ anywhere. And even in the big systems, where we use uh, a digital crossover, we use it purely as a crossover. We don't use it to do any, any EQing or, or corrective EQ for driver uh, issues or, or cabinet um, compromises that might have been made in design. Um, and that's something that's quite fundamental to us through all of our products. Uh, our kind of, our position on studio monitoring is very much that the monitor should be as neutral as possible and as accurate as possible. Um, and for us, the moment we start introducing other things into the, into the mix there with systems that maybe correct themselves for your room, that type of stuff, you're then listening to an interpretation uh, and, and you're not necessarily in control uh, of what the monitor is doing. Uh, and so for us, it really should be a, a pure, pure change straight through the monitor. 
to keep it as neutral as possible. So what we'll do now is we'll go next door, we'll have a little listen to um, the 2104. It will be a little bit pointless all of us trying to listen to 2104 uh, because it is near field, you really want to be in that kind of half metre to metre away. We'll have a little listen to it, but then at the end, uh, do come and have a listen and, uh, on your own and, and sit in the right position where you get to experience what that monitor does uh, and how that sounds. We'll then have a look at the S7, uh, which is a little six and a half inch uh, monitor, a um, little bit more base extension. Um, the 2104 uses a class D amplifier. It's the first time we've used a class D amplifier uh, in, in such a compact monitor. Uh, we've had to do that because of the, the space that we have for dissipating heat. We tend to usually use class AB amplifiers on all of our systems, so with the S series, the V series, uh, and then even this system here runs with a hybrid system of class D on the low end and then class ABs on the mid high uh, in the amplifier stage. So we'll have a listen to the S7 uh, and then we'll go up to the, um, the V2108 uh, and have a look listen to that one. Uh, that's, that's probably one of our most popular speakers uh, worldwide. Um, uh, used by, as I say, lots, lots of people, especially in the film scoring community actually. Um, so if we kind of start to move into this room here to the side, as much as we can cram in there, we'll, uh, we'll have a little listen to the, the little 2104 to start with. Who wants to kind of sit in the, the seat to begin with? I mean, someone sat there. Yeah, I'll go for it. All right. So, as I say, it's, it's not going to be relevant to a lot of you in the, the space because you're, you're so far away, so do come back and have a listen a little bit later on. And what we're going to be listening to is these little guys here. Um, now, they really are designed, so with you being kind of here in this kind of close proximity, they're designed for very compact spaces. Um, they're great for if you're on the move and they've also been designed uh, to look at address the needs for things like broadcast, uh, mobile broadcast or broad broadcast suites where you have very small edit suites uh, to work with. Um, so let's give this one go. Monster is not about turning stuff up crazy loud, you know, it's about listening and, and referencing what you're listening to. A bit later on, it's a big system. In the end, we will turn it up a bit so you can experience what it's doing. Try something a little bit more um, sort of rock based. Uh, a bit of audio slave. Um, so again, it's. Basically, in this, it's the positioning of sounds uh, and the separation that you hear between instruments vocal. This is quite a compressed track, uh, the recording of this. Um, and again, it's one of those things that you only really get when you listen to things over a relatively long period of time. Yeah. A quick listen doesn't really give you a proper feeling for it. So. Baseball, that is, 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 that is
emphasize the low end. Um, all the monitors, you know, point the studio monitor is to be as flat as possible. Lots of studio monitors measure quite close to each other. They all measure pretty flat, but they have quite a different tonal balance depending on where your crossover points are and how the speakers are tuned. Um, and what we kind of aim to do with our systems is to, to deliver a very flat response, uh, but one that's nice, it's musical still. You, know, you get a nice balance of all frequency bands and some monitors can sometimes overemphasize the mid band a little bit to give you lots of detail, but then they can be sometimes fatiguing, um, and other times you can find they're quite clinical to listen to, and if you're a musician working that can sometimes be quite difficult. Uh, because you're really like clinical? Quite clear, like, or, almost like you've zoomed into your mix, like really, oh, really okay. forward, yeah. and, um, and you get to a point where you kind of, it's almost difficult to listen to, because you, the detail is so, so, so much. Um, and what we strive to do is get this balance of accuracy, flat response, uh, and, and musicality, a very natural, yeah. natural kind of uh, response. Yeah. Um, and I think what we'll do in here is the best thing is if later on we individually go through speakers with people, because it's going to be impossible right. for people to, to sit and really listen uh, to what they do. Um, and what we'll do is we'll move these ones back and then we'll have a little listen to the S7s. Um, and it might be interesting actually for you to stay in the seat for this, you can hear oh, the shift through. Okay. And then what we'll do is with everyone else a little bit later on is come back and have a, have a listen to material that you guys might know and we can, we can find some stuff that you can reference to. Is everyone okay with that, yeah? Is that cool? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. Okay, cool. So, let's um, lift this guy back here. Put him on there. And back to this. And then what we'll do is we'll swap to, uh, I think one for the S7s. Um, very good. So we'll stay with that track for now, uh, again. So what you'll hear is these guys will open up a bit of a wider image, because uh, they're a bit further apart, uh, and you'll get a little bit more kind of uh, bass separation going on with them. Say the sound was like like this. Now yeah. I hear like this from the guitar, right? Yeah. But then I would say maybe I'm asking like from the vocals. Yeah. Um, I hear like that less from the vocals. Does that yeah. mean like it's higher or something? Uh, well, basically, what that is is because you're hearing more bass extension here, so that okay. shifts your perception of what you're hearing. You okay. hear more down, which makes it sound like the vocals go back a little bit. But what you actually is your reference point shifting a little bit. Okay. So the more extension you have, you find that that change can sometimes happen. Um, and this is why a lot of people have multiple monitors in the studio. You know, you'll have uh, some have more tones, yeah. it, and it's switching between these to give you this different kind of feel. Again, the positioning yeah. of the monitors makes a big difference. So these guys are wider apart. So again, you're going to get a wider stereo feel uh, yeah. on these ones right now, uh, the way this is set up. Um, and so that that plays a part in, in what you hear right. as well. Because for the first one, I was listening. Like the contrast is really interesting between the vocals and the guitars, oh, yeah. it sounds really good together. Yeah. And then for this one now, it, it's, the, it's the guitar and the drums, I'm like, oh wow. Like, yeah, now you're together. picking that out, what's yeah, going yeah. on, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, that's cool, you say it's like different reference points, like, that's cool, I like that. You absolutely need that, you know, that's, that's part of, you know, when you're in the studio, you are trying to produce a mix that is all about <coughs> translation and uh, going across lots of different mediums from earbuds to car stereos to docking stations to PA systems, you know. Uh, and, and when you're working in the studio, you're aiming to get your mix to be translate across all those different mediums as, as much sure. as possible. If you listen to speakers, uh, such as maybe some hi-fi speakers, where they'll have this exaggerated low end or high end, 
you will adapt your mix slightly based on that and then it won't translate so well and that's why studio monitors are all about being really accurate flat mm -hmm. and not necessarily that enjoyable to listen to you know from compared to like a hi-fi speaker you know a lot of people especially when they're starting out will go for a studio monitor that kind of does that smiley face EQ sound um, in the tuning of the speaker um, because whatever you put on immediately sounds quite nice, right. it sounds quite lovely. Right. But you don't want that. What you want is the monitor to really challenge you and make you really question your mix and work on your mix and tighten it up as much as possible so that when you take your mix elsewhere, you're going to get translation on what you do. That sounds smart, yeah. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go up to the uh, 2108s now. Um, and then we're going to listen to the big system, as I say. It's really important to me that lots of you come in here and listen to this stuff afterwards. Trying to demo it to you in, in one hit is kind of you know, not impossible. So we'll start the same track again. And we'll now go to the 2108. extension from the speaker so you start to hear a lot more of the lower end of the guitar the lower registers i would say um, as soon as it came in yeah yeah and you feel it a bit more as well exactly like there was as i was saying before these ones like it would this first one obviously like the vocals and that was i say the guitar and this yeah. one was the drums and that but i said that it took away power but with this one i felt like there was way more power across the map exactly and that was cool that was really cool so like you're way more immersed in it you know what i mean yeah well, well a lot of people i think one of the reasons the 2108 is so popular with uh, certainly the film school guys and a number of people who are that, you know, mixing their own music uh, and making the music at the same time, they're not working purely as the engineer point of view, is because with this one, uh, with the depth that you get in the low frequency extension going down to kind of the 40 hertz region, um, you kind of get more immersed in the music and the speaker almost disappears when you're listening to it, you're just listening to the music, you're kind of in the That's bubble almost. Cool. Um, there is uh, another track by the Wailing Jellies which I'll try for you. Um, and again, for everyone else, we'll do the same thing. Uh, so, let's give uh, this one a go. So again, on this one, um, you know, your eyes take over when we're, we're visually dominant animals. And when you close your eyes uh, and allow your, your hearing sense, which is incredible, incredibly powerful when people take it for granted how amazing the human ear is at detecting things like time difference it's, it's incredible um, but on this one when you close your eyes uh, and listen you will kind of probably find that the vocal comes right from the center it won't come from the speaker. when you open your eyes it will come more from the speakers mm -hmm. because your brain's telling you the sound's coming from there so you want me to close my eyes? So on your eyes, yeah, close your eyes. I know it sounds a bit weird. I know it sounds a bit weird. There's a camera here, what the fuck? Oh, this is the sound, bro. Okay. So let's give this a try. This was a little sketchy over this. Down, might as well be 
sound stage, for sure, which man. is really important when you're building your mix up about how you can place the instruments mm. within uh, within what you're working on. I had my eyes open the last ten seconds of that. As soon as I opened them, I hope he said like the voice was coming from there. Yeah. With my eyes closed, she was right there. Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, I'm tripping out. It was like that little boom, boom. I don't know what that instrument was. Yeah. But that proper threw my eyes everywhere. Like it was like, whoa. <laughs> it it, kind of, it totally immerses you. It's like you're in a bubble. If everyone right. else wants to sit and have a go at that, yeah, that was cool. we, we can try that now. Who wants to go yeah, give that spin? Don't go for it. Yeah, go for it. Sit down. We'll do that same. We'll run that same track a couple of times over, um, and you can all have a little kind of listen to that and get an idea for it. And then we'll go and have a listen to the bigger system, and then we'll come back in and uh, and listen to stuff again in here uh, for those who want to. So, again, same deal. Close your eyes. Take a stock item from that manufacturer, we will then test it, measure it, make changes to it, change the doping of the driver, the weight of the driver, and then load that into a cabinet and then put a really big class 80 amplifier on the back of it with no limiter in it. I'm so assuming the room plays a part. The room plays a part. This room's got a little bit of a lump in the low end, I, I would say, with the, this particular speaker in here, um, which is probably just down to purely positioning. If we move the speakers, we can change that. Um, all of our speakers are ported to the front, so they're quite forgiving of the environment they go into. When you have a monitor which has any ports to the rear, you become far more, the position becomes really critical because the energy is coming out from behind the speaker, hitting the wall, depending on the material, just and all of that stuff, that plays a part. But you are still listening to these in a relatively near field condition. But because of the bass extension, the room is now starting to take some no, they're fine. They are fine in an untreated room. Um, but again, it, coming back to the thing originally, you know, one of the most important things in the studio is your room. You know, buying all the gear in the world um, doesn't change what your room is. And you can use DSP to do some corrective things within your room, but at that point, you're introducing other artifacts to what you're doing, you know, what you're actually working on. So spending a little bit of time and a little bit of money just treating the room with panels, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. Um, 
and set, having the monitors in the right position. And a lot of time that can just be playing with them in the room, trying them in different places. Having them on isolation pods makes a huge difference can to them. Can you over treat them? You can. I mean, you can make a room too dead. That can happen. You know, people can get to a point where they make it too dry and it's no longer, again, enjoyable to listen to. It's almost like being anechoic. Mm. And, you know, no one likes being in an anechoic chamber. You kind of get mad after a few minutes. What yeah. I mean, like for writing, I do a lot of I do a lot of film stories. Well, that's kind of where this particular speaker has its strength in its user base. Um, Hans Zimmer uses these all the time. It's this speaker. Even though he has the big ones in the sockets, 95% of his work is 2108. Harry Gregson Williams, who did The Martian and all those of other amazing film stories. But you know what? What is it about that? These speakers that they are good for Gregson? I think it's because they're very natural. And it's because they, they don't have, as I said, some monitors can sound like they're almost zoomed in, like too much, to a point where they lose musicality. Because it's like, it's like almost if you look at something under a microscope, you know, you look at it, it's beautiful there, and then you zoom in so far. Now, in some scenarios, that's what you want. So you want some monitors where you can switch and do that. Um, for us, it's about delivering a very accurate response and maintaining the musicality that, that doesn't distract you. From what you're doing when you're listening to the monitor, that, that really is, yeah, what we go for in all of our ranges. Um, you know, obviously you can't get the same effect out of this little guy because he hasn't got the bass extension, but we get that transparency in that all-important critical vocal area. When we go to this one, we get a bit more bass extension, so we still have the same kind of vocal response. But because we're getting a bit more bass extension, it shifts where the vocal seems to sit within the mix. And then with these guys, it just gets a bit broader again. What's the model of this? This is the V2108. This here is the S7. Uh, and this is a new one, which you're the first people to ever hear this. This hasn't actually, this is a prototype out of the factory. And this is the V2104, which will be coming out later on this year. Um, so no one's actually heard this speaking yet. This is the first time for you guys to... How much do these big ones for? These ones are about sixteen hundred each, uh, plus the VAT for one. Uh, for one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, these ones here, seven twenty each, uh, plus the VAT, and then these ones here are actually going to be about eight hundred. So these ones are more expensive than mm. these ones. Uh, it's a bit more to produce and what we're doing with them um, from you know some of the materials that we're using in them. Um, so within this setup, the most kind of cost-effective one here would be the PS7. So who was next for having a listen and see? Who was who was going? You both. Yeah, you, 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 you're next. I was. I'm already. Are you? Yeah. You've been already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. 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 Right, while you're listening, I'm going to go and pay the ticket on my I've van. My, I've, so just done, I've just done my ticket. I'm going to yeah. give you two minutes of this while I run up the street and do my one. Right? Yes, so, let's, um, let's start this track again for you. Yeah, cool. Again, same deal. Yeah. Yeah. Close your eyes up. Yeah. Uh, just, I just Thank you. 
Yeah, you're right. I understand what we're trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> no one's believing us, dude. No, 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 no,